you're probably thinking that we've all got this a bit backwards because the warm-up act that you've never heard of normally comes out before the main performers that you have. But what I'm intending to try and do over the next 15, 20 minutes or so is go through some of the aspects of the law of consent that really interest me. Because I don't need to tell anybody in the room today that consent as a concept features in an awful lot of offending. But it features in various different ways. In the paper that you've got, I try and summarize what they are, and I'm not going to go through that now because if you're interested, you can see it. But in the appendix that I've done, which you'll get shortly as well, I'm sure, I've tried to look at the way in which we've attempted to reform the law of consent. And there have been an awful lot of false starts. But as everybody knows, when we get to 2003, there is this divergence that appears between the way we deal with consent in cases that are not sexual and the way we deal with it in cases which are. And for the very first time, we created a definition of consent, Section 74 of the 2003 Act, and Section 75, and of course Section 76, which gives us the irrebuttable presumptions where there is no particular consent. And that's all really interesting. But what's more interesting are the things the 2003 Act doesn't tell us anything about. What about the dark spaces that exist between the terms which Parliament has now given us and which we are expected to use in our efforts to work out what does and what does not amount to consent. So a quick refresher. Under the 2003 Act, consent, there has to be capacity, there has to be freedom, there has to be agreement by choice. There are circumstances in which we conclusively presume there was no consent, and those broadly mirror what the common law was saying, certainly as far as sexual offences were concerned, up until about 2003. But what does the Act not tell us? Well, there are two key issues that I really wanted to try and explore, which I think are interesting, which I hope you think are interesting too. The first one is the timing of consent. When do we have to consent? If we assume for a moment that what the Act is driving at is explicit consent, non-explicit consent no longer exists as far as sexual offending is concerned, it has to be explicit. When does it have to be given? If we imagine the example which is featured in literature elsewhere uh, of a husband who decides to uh, kiss his wife to wake her up while she's asleep, how do we deal with that situation within the framework of consent that we've been given by the statute? Um, before I came along tonight, I had a chat with a colleague of mine, I won't name her, and I asked her the question, I've got a lot of academics that I'll be talking to about something they know far more of than I do. How do I stop myself being on the receiving end of a mauling when I finish speaking? And her advice was quite simple. Flatter them. <laughs> Make sure that during the course of your short presentation you refer to as many articles or books they've written as possible to get them on your side. Challenge accepted. Here we go. Um, in looking at this question about timing, it seems pretty clear that there are very few cases in England and Wales where we've explored this issue. Two of them I refer to at the top of page two, a uh, case of White from 2010, and it's referred to rather elliptically in Assange. Uh, that's probably not surprising. We haven't yet had a case that's required this to be considered in any real detail. We do have section 75, this rather odd creature, the evidential presumptions which generally are ignored in practice. I've certainly never done a case where anybody's raised Section 75 at all. Uh, I know, this is my first tip, uh, Andrew Ashworth, in a very influential article that he wrote in the 2003 Criminal Law Review, uh, said, uh, looking at the common law authorities, you cannot consent when you are asleep. And it's a shame that we find asleep or otherwise unconscious at the time of the relevant act housed in Section 75 rather than in Section 76, where it will become an irrebuttable presumption, but that's where it is. It's different in other jurisdictions. James Chalmers wrote a piece in the Criminal Law of Scotland, uh, as he co-wrote with Fiona Leverick, and also in Scottish Criminal Law, because in Scotland the position, of course, is different. In Scotland, the presumption is irrebuttable, but he makes the following point. It may be the case that what we are describing is the inability of somebody to give their express consent to sexual contact at the time the contact takes place, but that in no way precludes the ability of the person to give their express consent 
to sexual contact before the contact takes place. I may say to my wife, and I say this with some trepidation because she's actually in the room, uh, that if she agrees to a certain form of touching while she is asleep, and that's exactly what happens, is that consensual touching on her part yes or no? They dealt with this in Canada in a case called JA, where the Canadians have provisions that are very similar to Scotland, which are very similar to South Africa, which are very similar to New South Wales, which are very similar to New Zealand. We appear to be a little different. Uh, that was a case where the complainant uh, had agreed that uh, her partner could engage in erotic asphyxiation and that sexual contact would take place when she lapsed into a state of unconsciousness. Uh, she awoke to find that he'd inserted a dildo into her anus and she was perfectly happy that he had done that. Uh, several years later, it would seem, uh, when the relationship fell apart, she made a complaint to the police that she'd been sexually assaulted by him. Later, she withdrew the complaint, but the prosecuting authorities continued with it. And the key issue for the Supreme Court of Canada to determine was whether her prior consent to that conduct qualified as consent. Was it enough that in full control of her faculties, she had agreed to that conduct occurring, even though at the time it happened, she couldn't exercise any choice at all? The court was split, and what's interesting is what split them. The majority were very much of the view that one of the reasons why we cannot recognize prior consent is that we cannot deny people the right to change their mind, and that what the law would preclude her from doing is from saying no. So she may very well have said yes, but she needs to have the ability to change her mind, and if she's unconscious, she can't do that. What they also didn't say, but I think has a real impact on their thinking, is a question of what's been described to me as dodgy defences. That if we allow the idea of prior consent into the law, then we're very close to saying to people, well, yeah, but before she got very drunk and lapsed into unconsciousness, she said it was all right for me to do this, and that's why I did it. And that might cause problems uh, in the way that we approach issues in sexual offence cases. For the minority, the position was equally clear. If we wish to respect the sexual autonomy of people, that means respecting their ability to make choices about things that happen to them in the future. And if we are to respect that, then we have to recommend uh, that the law adopt prior consent. One of the issues which they didn't explore, which again was of interest to me, is that if prior consent is not proper consent, so if I say, you are perfectly welcome to touch me when I am asleep, uh, and I'm happy for that to happen, even though I can't subsequently change my mind because I am asleep, uh, then I am agreeing that you can essentially sexually assault me. Uh, and does that make me an accessory to the sexual assault committed by my partner with my knowing encouragement when she touches me while I'm asleep, only for me to then wake up and say, that was fine, but the law, of course, would take a very different view. Is that really what we want to do? Uh, the authors of Brook and Ward, one of whom sits not very far from where I am, suggest that if the English and Welsh courts were to be seized of a case like JA, the likelihood is they'd agree with the reasoning of the majority. I'm not so sure. But one of the things that was very interesting about the Canadian approach in JA was the realisation by the majority about the issues that this can give rise to. That if we are going to deny or restrict people's sexual autonomy, there are going to be repercussions from that. How do we get around that? Well, either A, we're happy that there are consequences we're quite content that the affectionate husband ought to be convicted of sexual assault. That doesn't trouble us. If we are, then there are no problems. If we do think that that's an issue in the law, because we do think his partner's sexual autonomy ought to be properly respected, then there are eight things that we can do about it. And I've tried to set them out on page two. Some of these found reflection in the majority-minority judgments in JA. Number one, we can recognise a limited doctrine of prospective explicit consent. We can try and say that there are limited circumstances in which we will recognise that you can consent to things occurring in the future. One of the minority judgments uh, said that provided what you do is in accordance with the terms upon which prospective consent was given, then that's all right. So as long as you don't go beyond what was agreed upon beforehand, that's fine. Question, how would the sleeping person ever know? 
We could, number two, recognize a limited doctrine of retrospective explicit consent. We've never had this before. The idea that somebody after the event can agree that what happened to them prior was consensual, and that means no criminal liability. There is pedigree for this. Anybody who's recently thumbed the Statute of Westminster of 1285 will see within it the offence of ravishing a woman in circumstances where she didn't consent before or afterwards. So retrospective explicit consent is not unknown to us. We could recognise a limited doctrine of non-explicit consent, this idea that somebody's consent can be implied rather than needing to be expressed. That, of course, is problematic because that's exactly what we try to move away from in sexual offences, the idea that just because somebody's dressed a certain way or behaves a certain way, that they must be consenting to what's being done. But again, if they're on narrow confines, would that be workable? We can fiddle, in number four, with the definition of sexual. Canadian academics have suggested that if what you're really talking about is consensual sexual horseplay between adults in a long-term intimate relationship, then might we gently massage what we mean by sexual to exclude that sort of conduct so that it wouldn't constitute assault by penetration or sexual assault? Possibly, but sexual isn't a word that appears in the definition of rape. It wouldn't help you if you had sexual intercourse with your partner while they were unconscious. What about relying on the mens rea requirement? What about saying, aha, but although I can't consent because your prior consent doesn't count, I still reasonably believe that you are consenting. So the affectionate husband is saved from conviction because he doesn't have the mental element necessary for the offence. Well, that's a tricky one, because if your partner is asleep, how can you reasonably believe that they are consenting at the point when the activity occurs? And if consent itself has to be of the moment, doesn't reasonable belief in consent have to be of the moment too? And if it isn't, can the mental element work? But number six, what about refining the mental element? We do this with certain statutory offences. We have it in relation to a number of property offences. The defence or the mental element being, uh, if you had asked the owner, would they approve of that which you're doing with their property at the particular time, and you believe the answer is yes, then that would afford you a route to an acquittal. Is there a possibility that we can import the common law concepts or other statutory models into the 2003 Act to modify the mens rea to give the affectionate husband that route? Probably not. What about number seven? The Canadians had a bash at this too. Recognise the defence of de minimis. Well, we have one. Section 44 of the Offences Against the Person Act, 1861, affords a defence of de minimis in cases of assault or battery. Recent case of Austin says that's limited solely to private prosecutions. Would the court recognise that there may be limited circumstances in sexual offending where the sort of conduct that we are concerned with is at such a low level that we can avoid conviction altogether? The Canadian Supreme Court said no, sexual offending is not trifling in any way, shape or form. De minimis does not apply. Would we take a different view? And finally, eight, we rely on prosecutorial discretion. We acknowledge the offence is made out, the affectionate husband is guilty, but we rely on the prosecuting authorities to exercise the public interest to ensure that charges are not brought. Possibly. But again, the Supreme Court of Canada said that is not a sufficient safeguard to protect against what the minority considered to be an unjust outcome. So the 2003 Act doesn't help us greatly with this question about the timing of consent. And nor does it, I think, help us very much with the next subheading, deception and consent. Um, we have umpteen statements from very learned individuals about what is required to be in a person's mind in order for their agreement to be consent. I've set out a quote there just from Joel Feinberg, sufficiently competent, free, and informed. And it's the word informed that's important here. When Parliament came to introduce the 2003 Act, it had a wealth of literature at its disposal, Law Commission reports going back decades, setting the boundaries report, which was produced by a quasi-governmental body to try and help frame a statute that would work for the modern age. And yet, this is how Parliament chose to deal with deception. 
We have in section 76 the conclusive presumptions. Uh, and Andrew Ashworth again in his article in 2003 makes the obvious point here that that's a decision that Parliament has specifically taken to recognize deception only in relation to the operation of those presumptions. When we look at the definition of consent in section 74, the words informed and knowledge appear absolutely nowhere at all. Parliament missed the opportunity to include within the standard definition of consent a word or phrase that would guide us clearly to the view that it meant deception to be included both within the conclusive presumptions in section 76 and within the general definition in section 74. Why does that matter? Uh, we used to have an offence of procuring sexual uh, intercourse by false pretenses in section 3 of the Sexual Offences Act 1956. The Law Commission recommended its retention. Parliament chose not to retain it. Why? Well, to my mind, there are three possible answers to that question. Either Parliament thought, well, we just don't need an offence like that. We don't think conduct like that ought to be criminalised. We don't need to replace it with anything in the 2003 Act. The conclusive presumptions deal with the questions of deception well enough. The second point might be, well, consent does the job. We don't need a separate offence like that because consent in section 74 is more than adequate to cater for situations where people engage in deceptions not catered for by the conclusive presumptions, or more likely, I think, they just forgot about it. And so its absence probably tells us not very much at all about what they meant section 74 to mean. There are articles aplenty from Joe Miles, from Jonathan, John Herring, from others, I hope I'm ticking the boxes here, dealing with what the absence of informed and knowledge and deception from elsewhere in the Act actually means. And the argument goes, if we can assume Parliament meant to confine deception to Section 76, then it has nothing to do with Section 74 at all. It doesn't matter what other deceptions are being perpetrated upon somebody else. The law of consent is not designed to cater for that. And might there be good reasons why we take that view? Uh, well, there might be. Um, I don't want to wade into too deep jurisprudential waters, but what is the reason why we decide that rape is wrong? Some explanations advanced have focused on uh, the denial of autonomy, the use of the body, and that rape is an offence akin to spiritual murder, the words of Robin West. Nick McBride rather takes the point that if that's right, then the other factors that are relevant to the question of consent are generally contemporaneous with the act itself. We know whether there has been force, we know whether somebody's been asleep, we know whether they've been drunk. But deception in the way that it works may not be uncovered for months, years, decades, and if the act at the time does not appear wrongful to us, uh, why should we allow deception to operate in such a way as to transform conduct willed and welcomed into a serious sexual offence. All very interesting, but the court said in Assange, hard luck, deception features in section 74, even if you're not within section 76, section 74 captures you. But how is my question? Is it to do with capacity? No, capacity is about one's ability to understand and make your choice. The absence of information is not, I would suspect, catered for by the question of capacity. What about freedom? Does it have to do with freedom? Again, no, I suggest. Freedom is all concerned with pressure, with threats and force. The point is made in the new edition of uh, Ormerod Smith Hogan Essentials of Criminal Law that freedom might mean not just freedom from pressure, but freedom from misinformation. Uh, I'm not sure that's right, and it's a not a point made by the full fat version of Smith and Hogan either. Um, is it to do with choice? Uh, does it mean that the statute says nothing about knowledge, but we have to read into it the idea that you can only make a choice if you have the information in front of you to be able to do it? Well, possibly not. And the reason I say possibly not is because even if the information that you have is not all the information that you might need to enable you to make the right choice, you're still in the position to choose. And if you make a choice, then doesn't the definition in section 74 say that you've consented? And where does that leave deception? Well, I don't think the courts have approached this in a particular analytical way at all. 
We all know about the case of McNally, about somebody pretending to be somebody else, about it, the conduct not being caught by Section 76. But the language the court employs is about the vitiation of consent. And you can only vitiate it if you've got it. And if that's right, that tends to mean, to me at least, if the court's been tight with its use of language, that there is consent, but we look to the common law to provide the answer to the question, is this consent nullified, negated, vitiated, removed by something else? And if we're doing that, really, if that's what's going on here, and deception beyond Section 76 isn't being dealt with in the 2003 Act, but being dealt with by the common law, what's the justification for approaching it differently when we look at sexual offences as opposed to when we look at offences against the person? Why do we, with sexual offending, appear to be able to recognise situations in which deception operates to negative consent, which we wouldn't recognise in non-sexual conduct? I'm not sure what the justification for that is. So, three quick conclusions. Uh, if you take the view, and I do, uh, that the law of consent needs to be looked at again, what are the options for reforming it? First of all, we get rid of it. Victor Tadros suggested this uh, not all that long ago. Why can't we, as far as sexual offending is concerned, remove consent altogether? We just say, if you have sex with somebody in circumstance X with state of mind Y equals rape. If you have sex with them when they're asleep and you know they're asleep, it's rape. You have sex with them when they're drunk, you know they're drunk, it's rape. Might that work? Well, the Scottish Law Commission had a little look at this when they were advising on the subject of sexual offending and they had a nil response from consultees who thought that was a good idea. So a big fat zero. What else might we do? Well, we might do what John Spencer has suggested. I've got a tick in my column. Uh, in an article in Archibald Review, why don't we reintroduce Section 3 or something similar to it? Because if we've got this choice between saying, here's a deception, it's either rape or it's nothing, and the court has to make a determination as to whether the deception, however you might describe it, is sufficiently serious to warrant a conviction for such a crime, uh, why not give the court that halfway house again? Uh, finally, what we could do is get rid of Section 74, 75 and 76, have a clear out. Uh, and I like uh, what the Scottish Draft Criminal Code says about consent. Because if you've never read it, then I recommend that you do. What the Scottish Criminal Code suggests is that you take all of your offences that have consent as a component part of them, that you do not, as to the offences themselves, try and offer a definition of what consent is, but at the very end, I think from memory, proposed section 111 sets out circumstances in which there is not consent, and that applies across the board. So whether it's an offence against the person, or a sexual offence, a slap on the back, or a slap on the bum, you look at the same types of provisions in deciding whether a crime is made out or not. Uh, I think that's worth looking at. Uh, I think if the Law Commission has the time, and I suspect it probably doesn't, that that would be a very fruitful exercise for them to undertake. Thank you. Uh, as a sometime Old Bailey judge, now retired, uh, I'm not allowed to do any advocacy. However, uh, I've often thought I don't really mind about that, but I would like to indulge in some appellate advocacy, so maybe now I can pretend I've got that opportunity. Uh, I'd like to thank Paul and pay tribute to him for extraordinary industry for um, raising points which haven't seen the light of day for some time. And who knows, some of the cases uh, that we've had over the last 10 years or so, since we've had section, section 74, might have gone the other way if Paul had been arguing them. It seems to me my starting point has to be that uh, the sexual autonomy of the individual reigns supreme. And you only have to look at the terms of Section 74, freedom of choice. And I could, uh, I suppose if I were counsel, I'd say sit down now. But uh, obviously I will go into a little more detail. Let's look at where we are now. The irrebuttable presumption, Section 76, 
to adopt Paul's technique, infer that Karl Lehr had been reduced to vanishing point. Quite rightly so, because of course they extend the definition of, of, of rape. Section 75, evidential presumptions, they're a complete damp squib. They hardly ever arise. I only know of one court of appeal case where in fact the defendant pleaded guilty. And then we have section 74 itself. It, it wasn't a complete surprise that it focused on the sexual autonomy of the individual. We have cases even before section 74 when we didn't have a statutory definition such as Malone and Callister, which made it quite clear that that's what you must focus on. Uh, and then we have helpful opinions such as that of Baroness Hale in Cooper, the last case in the House of Lords before it became the Supreme, of Court, Supreme Court where she was dealing with the offences designed to protect the mentally disordered, but she was explaining the whole approach of the Sexual Offences Act 2003. You're dealing with a particular individual, a particular place, at a particular time. So, we must be considering the complainant's state of mind at the time of the activity. Any other interpretation would undermine the complainant's right to decide at that time of the sexual activity. It would also have a tendency, in some cases, to undermine the principles in respect of the limited relevance of previous sexual history. Parliament chose not to include the concept of subsisting and free agreement. It could have done so. The courts were entitled to interpret Section 74 in the way they have during the last 10 to 12 years. Yes, we do say the majority decision in JA, the Canadian case, is absolutely right and would uh, apply in this jurisdiction. Real consent necessarily implies the capacity to withdraw consent. And when it comes to public policy, the unlikely prosecution of an affectionate husband is being put in the balance as against the protection of the potential massive invasion of the autonomy of the individual, many of whom will be vulnerable. The real affectionate husband, and why not wife as far as the other non-consensual offence are concerned, would never be prosecuted in the unlikely event that his wife or husband would never. Um, the affectionate partner does not need the protection of the responsible prosecutorial discretion although no doubt he would have it. I in the most unlikely event of such a prosecution, an English court is likely to follow the approach of, of a New Zealand case, and I'm very grateful to Paul for bringing this to my notice in the best traditions of, of, of the bar. Uh, this is a case where um, the Canadian defense to rape is based on there being reasonable grounds for the belief uh, and the High Court decided that when it came to a complainant who was asleep, the mental element defense would still apply. Uh, it'd still be a matter for the jury. I move on to deceptions. The terms of Section 74 make it clear that there to have been a genuine consent, there must have been agreement by choice. If a defendant has actually the carried out a deception upon the complainant and it's operated upon his or her mind, then a jury is entitled to find there's been no freedom of choice and thus no consent. The failure to include other deceptions in section 75, that damp squib, or section 76, does not mean that Parliament wished to exclude them as being relevant to consent. As Sir John Thomas, as he then was, pointed out in Assange, it would be absurd if non-deceptions could be taken <coughs> into account, but deceptions that weren't Section 76 deceptions should be disregarded. Joe Miles and I have been having this argument for many years, uh, and I didn't gloat when we got the decision in Assange, yes. did I? <laughs> <laughs> but her interpretation exaggerates the scope of Section 76. 
In many ways, of course, as we all know, it replicates the common law, simply identifying the relatively rare situations where the conclusive presumptions arise. It cannot found a principle that a but-for mistake can never vitiate consent. The presumptions were designed to buttress Section 74, not to limit it. And as the Igor judge, as he then was, pointed out in Jeter, when they do apply, the Section 76 presumptions are directed to the process of proving absence of consent to whichever sexual act is alleged. They are concerned with the proof of consent rather than its definition. We now uh, uh, move on to the authors of Smith and Hogan. They are correct to say that the choice presupposes there are options from which to choose and in turn presupposes that B is possessed of adequate information about each to make an informed choice between them. An informed choice does not need to be a wise one. Now an area where Paul and I agree. It is unsatisfactory that there's no guiding principle to enable identification of deceptions which are capable of vitiating consent. Clearly, misrepresentations as to wealth or feelings cannot. However, factors such as gender, according to McNally, and failure to wear a condom, a sorge, can. And we do have this intractable point, as David Omrod and Carl Laird observe, that it's not clear whether any deception as to any condition at all has the potential to fall within Section 74. However, what we now have is not what Paul describes as um, unleashed deception to run amok. A, a careful analysis of the cases in this area, and there are relatively few, does not demonstrate any running amok. Of course, we did have the offence in respect of sections of section three deceptions, uh, uh, and certainly there might be a case for having such an offence now, but we do not. We must focus upon section 74. Finally, to Paul's conclusions. There's no reason why consent should not have a different meaning in different concept, contexts. Uh, consent needs to have a special meaning in the context of sexual offences. To state what is self-evident, consent to a medical operation is a wholly different situation. Uh, sexual relations are very fragile. The boundaries between human beings are at their most fragile, perhaps in that context. The desire for sexual contact waxes and wanes in complete contrast to the need for medical treatment. And there's significant public misunderstanding as to the meaning of consent in respect of sexual offences. Of course, it's not unknown for young people to think they've consented when there, in fact, has been no genuine consent. There must be a parity of status between sexual partners. So I would argue that we do need a special definition in respect of, of sexual offences. One area where you could argue that we should take that definition further is where uh, we have physical harm caused during sexual activity. The criminal law distinguishes between consent in different contexts in ways that may not be clearly articulated anyway, but are clearly founded in ideas of public morality and social utility. And so, of course, and I'm now thinking of the case of Brown, the leading authority on the operation of consent to injuries caused during sadomasochistic encounters, where, of course, you have an overlap there between sexual activity and physical harm. And it seems to me that you could allow the consent based on uh, the individual's autonomy, autonomy in sexual offenses to enter that area as far as physical harm is concerned. 
finally, the alternatives to consent, the Victor Tadros definitional model. Well, it will come as no surprise to any of you that in my view, that would completely fail. It fails to acknowledge the autonomy of the individual to be found in consent. And please let us not go to airy the idea of having preordained categories. We all know how difficult that is when we have complicated factual matrices occurring. It seems to me that that would be doomed to failure. Why is it so important to have the same provisions governing the operation of consent in all criminal offences? Uh, I, I would argue that it is not essential. We are not living in a jurisdiction where deceptions are running amok, nor should we allow a most unlikely scenario, the affection of husband, to divert us from the proper focus on the complainant's autonomy. Juries are given far more assistance as to how to approach consent. Forgive me for burdening you with an example in our appendix, which you've all received. Um, juries are told that context is all important. They're not being asked to impose their own moral values. Provided they're properly directed, why shouldn't juries be entitled to decide whether there may have been a genuine consent? 